Disc 22, The Last Continent By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 5x18 Building a boat is not beyond men like us, Senior Wrangler, Wrangler. Quite, Dean All we have to do is search this island until we find a book with a title like Practical Boat Building for Beginners Exactly It'll be plain sailing after that, Dean Ah ha ha He glanced up, and swallowed hard M.R.S. Whitlow was sitting on a log in the shade, fanning herself with a large leaf. The sight stirred things in the senior wrangler. He was not at all sure what they were, but little details like the way something creaked when she moved twanged bits of the senior wrangler as well. You all right, senior wrangler? You look as if the heat is getting to you. Just a little, warm, Dean. The dean looked past him as he loosened his collar. Well, they haven't been long, he said. The other wizards were walking down the beach. One advantage of a long wizarding robe is that it can be held like an apron, and the chair of indefinite studies was bulging at the front even more than usual. Found anything to eat, said the senior wrangler. E.R., yes. Fruit and nuts, I suppose grumbled the dean. E.R., yes, and then again, no, said the lecturer in recent runes. Um, it's E.R., yes, and then again, no, said the lecturer in recent runes. Um, it's rather odd, the chair of indefinite studies let his burden spill out onto the sand. There were coconuts, other nuts of various sizes, and assorted hairy or noble vegetable things. All rather primitive, said the dean. And probably poisonous. Well, the bursar's been eating things like there's no tomorrow, said the lecturer in recent runes. The bursar burped happily. That doesn't mean there will be, said the dean. What's up with you fellows? You keep looking at one another. E.R., we've tasted a few things too, dean said the lecturer in recent runes. Ah, I see the gatherers have returned, roared R.I.D.C. Oli happily, walking towards them. He waved three fish on a string. Anything resembling potatoes in there, chaps. You're not going to believe any of this, mumbled the lecturer in recent runes. You're going to accuse us of trickery. What are you talking about, said the dean. They don't look very tricky to me. The chair of indefinite studies gave a sigh. Have a coconut, he said. Do they go off bang or something? No, nothing like that at all. The dean picked up a nut, gave it a suspicious look, and banged it on a stone. It fell into two exact halves. There was no milk to spill out. Inside the husk was a brown inner shell full of soft white fibers. R.I.D.C. Oli picked up a bit of it and sniffed. I don't believe this, he said. That's R.I.D.C. Oli picked up a bit of it and sniffed. I don't believe this, he said. That's not natural. So, said the dean. It's a coconut full of coconut. What's odd about that? The Arch-Chancellor broke off a piece of the shell and handed it over. It was soft and slightly crumbly. The Dean tasted it. Chocolate, he said. R.I.D.C. Oli nodded. Dairy milk, by the taste of it. With a creamy coconut filling. That's not poffable, said the Dean, his cheeks bulging. Spit it out, then. I think I might perhaps try a little more, said the dean, swallowing. In a spirit of inquiry, you understand. The senior wrangler picked up a noble bluish nut about the size of a fist and tapped it experimentally. It shattered but was held together because of the gooey contents. The smell was very familiar. A careful taste confirmed it. The wizards regarded the nut's innards in shocked silence. It's even got the blue veins, said the senior wrangler. Yes, we know, we tried one, 
said the Chair of Indefinite Studies weekly. And, after all, there is such a thing as a breadfruit I've heard of it, said R.I.D.C. Oli. And I might believe there's such a thing as a nut rally chocolate covered coconut, because chocolate's a kind of potato a bean, possibly, said Ponderstabins. Whatever. But I damn well don't believe there's such a thing as a mature Lancre blue runny cheese nut. He prodded the thing. But nature does come up with some very funny coincidences, Arch-Chancellor, but nature does come up with some very funny coincidences, Arch-Chancellor, said the Chair of Indefinite Studies. Why, I myself, as a child, once dug up a carrot which, ah ha ha, most amusingly looked just like a man with AER, said the Dean. It was only a little sound, but it had a certain portentous quality. They turned to look at him. He'd been peeling away the yellowing husk from something like a small bean pod. What he now held ha, huh? yes, good joke, said R.I.D.C. Oli. They certainly don't grow on I didn't do anything. Look, it's still got bits of pith and stuff on it, said the dean, waving the thing wildly. R.I.D.C. Oli took it, sniffed it, held it up to his ear and shook it and then said quietly. Show me where you found it, will you? The bush was in a small clearing. Dozens of the little green shoots hung down between its tiny leaves. Each was tipped by a flower, but the flowers were curling up and falling off. The crop was ripe. Multicolored beetles zoomed away from the bush as the dean selected a pod and peeled it open, revealing a slightly damp white cylinder. He examined it for a few seconds, then put one end in his mouth, took a box of matches from a pocket in his hat, and lit up. Quite a smooth smoke, he said. His hand shook slightly as he took the cigarette out of his mouth and blew a smoke ring. Cork filter, too, he said. ER, well, both tobacco and cork are naturally occurring vegetable products quavered the Chair of Indefinite Studies. Chair, said R.I.D.C. Oli. Chair, said R.I.D.C. Oli. Yes, Arch-Chancellor. Shut up, will you? Yes, Arch-Chancellor. Ponderstabins broke open a cork tip. There was a tiny ring of what well might have been seeds, he said. But that can't be right, because the Dean wreathed in blue smoke, had been staring at the nearby vines. Has it occurred to anyone else that those pods are remarkably rectangular, he said. Go for it, Dean, said R.I.D.C. Oli. A brown outer husk was pulled aside. Ah, said the Dean. Biscuits. Just the thing with cheese. E.R. said Ponder. He pointed. Just beyond the bush a couple of boots lay on the ground. Rinswind ran his fingers over the cave wall. The ground shook again. What's causing that, he said. Oh, some people say it's an earthquake, some say it's the country drying up, others say it's a giant snake rushing through the ground, said Scrappy. Which is it? The wrong sort of question. They definitely looked like wizards, thought Rinswind. They had that basic cone shape familiar to anyone who had been to Unseen University. They were cone shape familiar to anyone who had been to Unseen University. They were holding staffs. Even with the crude materials available to them the ancient artists had managed to portray the knobs on the ends. But Yu Yu hadn't even existed 30,000 years ago. Then he noticed. For the first time, the drawing right at the end of the cave. There were a lot of the ochre handprints on top of it, almost and the thought expanded in his mind in a sneaky way. As though someone had thought that they could hold it down onto the rock, prevent it this was a silly thought, he knew prevent it from getting out. He brushed away some dust. Oh, no, he mumbled. It was an oblong box. The artist hadn't got the hang of conventional perspective, 
but there was no doubt that he'd tried to paint hundreds of little legs. That's my luggage. Always the same, right, said Scrappy, behind him. You arrive okay and your luggage ends up somewhere else. Thousands of years in the past. Could be a valuable antique. It's got my clothes in it. They'll probably be back in style, then. You don't understand. It's a magical box. It's supposed to end up where I am. It probably where you are. Just not when. It probably where you are. Just not when is what? Oh. I told you time and space were all stirred up, didn't I? You wait till you're on your journey. There's places where there's several times happening at once and places where there's hardly any time at all, and times when there's hardly any place. You've got to sort it out, right? What, like shuffling cards, said Rinswind. He made a mental note about on your journey. Yep. That's impossible. You know, I'd have said so too. But you will do it. Now, you'll have to concentrate about this bit, right? Scrappy took a deep breath. I know you're going to do it because you've already done it. Rinswind put his head in his hands. I told you about time and space here being mixed up, said the kangaroo. I've already saved the country, have I? Yep. Oh, good. Well, that wasn't so difficult. I don't want much a medal, perhaps, the grateful thanks of the population, maybe a small pension and a ticket home, he looked up. I'm not going to get any of that, though, am I? No, because I haven't already done it yet I haven't already done it yet. Exactly. You're getting the hang of it. You have to go and do what we know you're going to do because you've already done it. In fact, if you hadn't done it already I wouldn't be here to make sure it gets done. So you'd better do it. Facing terrible dangers. The kangaroo waved a paw. Slightly terrible, it said. And go for many miles over parched and trackless terrain. Well, yet. We haven't got any of the other sort. Rinswind brightened up slightly. And I'll meet comrades whose strengths and skills will be a great help to me. Don't bet on it. Any chance of a magic sword? What would you do with a magic sword? Fair enough. Fair enough. Forget the magic sword. But I've got to have something. Cloak of invisibility, potion of strength, something like that that stuff's for people who know how to use them, mister. You'll have to rely on your native wit. I've got nothing. What sort of quest is that? Can't you give me any hints? You may have to drink some beer, said the kangaroo. It cringed back for a moment, as if confident of facing a storm of objections. Rinswine said. Oh. Right. Well. I know how to do that. What direction am I supposed to go, supposed to go? Oh, you'll find it. And when I get to where I'm going, what am I supposed to do? It'll, be obvious, right? And how will I know I've done it? The wet will come back. The wet what? It'll rain. I thought it never rained here, said Rinswind. See. I knew you were smart. The sun was setting. The rocks around the edge of the cave glowed red. Rinswine stared at them for a while, and reached a brave decision. I'm not the man to shirk when the fate of whole countries is in the balance, he said. I will make a start at dawn to complete this task which I have already completed, by Hoki, or my name isn't Rinswand. Rinswind, said the kangaroo. Indeed. Well said, mate. Then I should get some sleep, if I were you. Could be a busy day tomorrow. I've not been found wanting when duty calls, said Rinswind. 
he reached into a hollow log and, after some rummaging around, pulled out a plate of egg and chips. See you at dawn, then. Ten minutes later he stretched out on the sand with the log as his pillow, and looked up at the purple sky. Already a few stars were coming out. Looked up at the purple sky. Already a few stars were coming out. Now, there was something. Oh, yes. The kangaroo was lying down on the other side of the waterhole. Rinswind raised his head. You said something about when he created this place, and you talked about him, yep. Only. I'm pretty sure I've met the creator. Short bloke. Does all his own snowflakes. Yet. Yeah. And when did you meet him? When he was making the world, as a matter of fact. Rinswine decided to refrain from mentioning that he'd dropped a sandwich into a rock pool at the time. People don't like to hear that they may have evolved from somebody's lunch. I get around quite a lot, he added. Are you coming the raw prawn? What? Oh, no. Certainly not. Coming a raw prawn? Not me. That's something I never do. Or even cooked prawns. Or crustaceans of any sort, especially in rock pools. Not me. E.R., what was it that you actually meant? Well, he didn't create this place, said Scrappy, ignoring him. This was done after. Can that happen? Why not? Well, it's not like, you know, building on over the stables, is it, said Rinswind. Someone just wanders along when a world's all finished and slings down an extra continent. Happens all the time, mate, said Scrappy. Bloody hell, yet. Why not, anyway? If other creators go around leaving ruddy great empty oceans, someone's bound to fill em up, right? Someone's bound to fill em up, right? Does a world good, too, having a fresh look, new ideas, new ways? Rinswine stared up at the stars. He had a mental vision of someone walking from world to world, sneaking in extra lands when no one was looking. Yes indeed he said. I for one would not have thought of making all the snakes deadly, and all the spiders deadlier than the snakes. And putting pockets on everything? Great idea. There you go, then, said Scrappy. He was hardly visible now, as the dark filled up the cave. Made a lot of them, has he? Yep. Why? So's maybe at least one of them won't get mucked up. Always puts kangaroos on em, too. Sort of a signature, you might say. Does this creator have a name? Nope. He's just the man who carries the sack that contains the whole universe. A leather sack. Sounds like him, the kangaroo agreed. The whole universe in one small sack. Yep. Rinswine settled back. I'm glad I'm not religious, he said. It must be very complicated. After another five minutes he began to snore. After half an hour he moved his head slightly. Head slightly. The kangaroo didn't seem to be around. With almost super Rinswine speed he was upright and scrambling up the fallen rocks, over the lip of the cave and into the dark oven of the night. He sighted on a random star and got into his stride, ignoring the bushes that lashed at his bare legs. Ha! Huh. He was not going to be found wanting when duty called. He did not intend to be found at all. In the cave the water in the pool rippled under the starlight, the expanding circles lapping against the sand. On the wall was an ancient drawing of a kangaroo, in white and red and yellow. The artist had tried to achieve on stone what might better have been attempted with eight dimensions and a large particle accelerator, he'd tried to include not just the kangaroo now but also the kangaroo in the past, and the kangaroo in the future and, in short, not what the kangaroo looked like but what the kangaroo was. 
Among other things, as it faded, it was grinning. Among the complexities that made up the intelligent biped known to the rest of the world as MRS Whitlow was this. There was no such thing as an informal meal in MRS Whitlow's world. If MRS Whitlow made sandwiches even just for herself she would put a sprig of parsley on the top. She placed a napkin on her lap to drink a cup of tea. If the table could have a vase of flowers and a place mat with a tasteful view of something nice, so much the better. It was unthinkable that she should eat a meal balanced on her knees. In fact it was unthinkable to think of MRS Whitlow as having knees, although the senior was unthinkable to think of MRS Whitlow as having knees, although the senior wrangler had to fan himself with his hat occasionally. So the beach had been scoured to find enough bits of driftwood to make a very rough table, and some suitable rocks to use as seats. The senior wrangler dusted one off with his hat. There we are, MRS Whitlow, the housekeeper frowned. I am really sure it's not done for the staff to eat with the gentlemen, she said. Be our guest, MRS Whitlow, said Aridc Oli. I really can't. It does not do to get ideas above one's station, said MRS Whitlow. I would never be able to look you in the face again, sir. I hope I know my place. Aridc Oli looked blank for a moment, and then said quietly. Faculty meeting, gentlemen. The wizards went into another huddle a little way along the beach. What are we supposed to do about that? I think it's very commendable of her. Her world is below stairs, after all. Yes, very well, but it's not as if there are any stairs on this island. Could we build some? We can't let the poor woman sit off by herself somewhere, that is my point. We spent ages on that table. And did you notice something about the driftwood, Arch-Chancellor? Looked like perfectly ordinary wood to me, Stubbins. Branches, tree trunks, and whatnot. That's the strange thing, sir, because it's very simple, or I DC only. I hope that, as gentlemen, we know how to treat a it's very simple, or I DC only. I hope that, as gentlemen, we know how to treat a woman lady. Let me just say that was unnecessarily sarcastic, Dean, said Aridc Oli. Very well. If the Prophet Osiri won't go to the mountain, the mountain must go to the Prophet Osiri. As they say in Clatch. He paused. He knew his wizards. I believe, in fact, that it's in Omnia that Ponder began. Aridc Oli waved a hand. Something like that, anyway. And that is why MRS Whitlow dined alone at the table, while the wizards sat around the fire a little way away, except that very frequently one of them would lumber over to offer her some choice bit of nature's bounty. It was obvious that starvation would not be a problem on this island, although dyspepsia and gout might be. Fish was the main course. Frenzied searching had failed to locate a steak bush so far but had found, in addition to numerous more conventional fruits, a pasta bush, a sort of squash that contained something very much like custard and, to Ridcully's disgust, a pineapple-like plant the fruit of which was, when the husk had been stripped away, a large plum pudding. Obviously it's not really a plum pudding, he protested. We just think it's like a plum pudding because it tastes exactly like a plum pudding, his voice trailed off. It's got plums and currants in it, said the senior wrangler. Pass the custard squash, will you? My point is that we only think they look like currants and plums, no, we also think they taste like currants and plums, said the senior wrangler. No, we also think they taste like currants and plums said the senior wrangler. Look, Arch-Chancellor, there's no mystery. Obviously wizards have been here before. This is the result of perfectly ordinary magic. Perhaps our lost geographer did a bit of experimenting. Or it's sorcery, perhaps. 
Some of the things that got created in the old days, well, a cigarette bush is very small beer by comparison, eh? Talking of small beer, said the dean, waving his hand, pass me the rum, will you? MRS Whitlow doesn't approve of strong liquor, said the senior wrangler. The dean glanced at the housekeeper, who was daintily eating a banana, a feat which is quite hard to do. He put down the coconut shell. Well, she. I am. I don't see, well, damn it all, that's all I've got to say. Or bad language, said the lecturer in recent runes. I vote we take some of those bees back with us, said the chair of indefinite studies. Marvelous little creatures. No footling around being content with making boring honey. You just reach up and pick one of these handy little wax containers and Bob's your uncle. She takes all the peel off slowly before she eats it. Oh, dear, are you all right, senior wrangler? Is the heat getting to you? What? Eh? Hum? Oh, nothing. Yes. Bees. Wonderful things. They glanced up at a couple of the bees, who were busying themselves around a flowering bush in the last of the light. They were leaving little black smoke trails. Shooting around like little rockets, said the Arch-Chancellor. Amazing. I'm still worried about those boots, said the senior wrangler. You'd think the I'm still worried about those boots, said the senior wrangler. You'd think the man had been pulled right out of them. It's a tiny island, man, said R.I.D.C. Oli. All we've seen is birds, a few little squeaky things and a load of insects. You don't get big fierce animals on islands you can practically throw a stone across. He must have just, felt a bit carefree. It's a bit hot for boots here, anyway. So why haven't we seen him? Ha! Huh. He's probably lying low, said the dean. Ashamed to face us. Keeping a nice sunny island in your study is against university rules. Is it? said Ponder. I've never seen it mentioned. How long has it been a rule? Ever since I've had to sleep in a freezing bedroom, said the dean, darkly. Pass the bread and butter pudding fruit, will you? Okay said the librarian. Ah, nice to see you your old shape, old chap, said R.I.D.C. Oli. Try and keep it up for longer this time, eh? Okay. The librarian was sitting behind a pile of fruit. Normally he wouldn't question such a perfect piece of positioning, but now even the bananas were bothering him. There was the same sensation of wrongness. There were long yellow ones, and stubby ones, and red ones, and fat brown ones he stared at the remains of the fish. There was a big silver one, and a fat red one, and a small grey one, and a flat one a bit like a place obviously some sorcerer landed here and wanted to make the place more homely, the senior wrangler was saying, but he sounded far off. The librarian was counting. The plum pudding plant, the custard squash vine, the chocolate coconut he turned his head to look at the trees. And now he knew what he was looking for, he couldn't see it anywhere. The senior wrangler stopped talking as the ape scrambled to his knuckles and sped back to the high tide line. The wizards watched in silence as he scrabbled through the heaped up seashells. He came back with a double handful, which he dropped triumphantly in front of the arch-chancellor. Okay. What's that? Old chap. Okay. Yes, very pretty, but what's okay? The librarian seemed to remember what kind of intellects he was dealing with. He held up a finger and looked at R.I.D.C. Oli inquiringly. Okay. Still not quite with you two fingers went up. Okay okay. Not sure I fully okay okay okay. Ponder Stubbins looked at the three fingers now raised. I think he's counting, sir. The librarian handed him a banana. 
Ah, the old how many fingers am I holding up, game, said the dean. But usually we all have to have a bit more to drink first. The librarian waved his hand at the fish, at the meal, at the shells and at the background of trees. One finger stabbed at the sky. Okay. It's all one to you, said Aridc Oli. It's one big place. It's one to remember. The librarian opened his mouth again, and then sneezed. A very large red seashell lay on the sand. Oh, dear, said Ponder Stubbins. That's interesting, said the Chair of Indefinite Studies. He's turned into quite a good specimen of the giant conch. You can get a marvelous sound out of one of them if you blow in the pointy end, volunteers, said the Dean, almost under his breath. Oh, dear, said Ponder again. What's up with you? said the dean. There's only one, said Ponder. That's what he was trying to tell us. One what, said Aridc Oli. Of everything, sir. There's only one of everything. It was, he thought later, a good dramatic line. People ought to have looked at one another in growing and horrified realization and said things like, by George, you know, he's right. But these were wizards, capable of thinking very big thoughts in very small chunks. Don't be daft, man, said Aridc Oli. There's millions of the damn shells, for a start. Yes, sir, but look, they're all different, sir. All the trees we found, there was only one of each sort, sir. Lots of banana trees but they all produce different types of bananas. There was only one cigarette tree, wasn't there? Lots of bees, though, said Aridc Oli. Lots of bees, though, said Aridc Oli. But only one swarm, said Ponder. Millions of beetles, said the dean. I don't think I've seen two alike, sir. Well, that's interesting said Aridc Oli, but I don't see one of anything doesn't work, sir, said Ponder. It can't breed. Yes, but they're only trees, Stubbins. Trees need males and females too, sir. They do. Yes, sir. Sometimes they're different bits of the same tree, sir. What? You sure? Yes. Sir. My uncle grew nuts, sir. Keep it down, boy, keep it down. M.R.S. Whitlow might hear you. Ponder was taken aback. What, sir? But, well, she is M.R.S. Whitlow, sir, what's that got to do with the price of feet? I mean, presumably there was a Mr. Mr. Whitlow, sir. Ridcully's face went wooden for a moment and his lips moved as he tried out various responses. Finally he settled, weakly, for. That's as maybe, but it all sounds pretty mucky to me. I'm afraid that's nature for you, sir. I used to like walking through the woods on a nice spring morning, Stubbins. You mean to say the trees were at it like knives the whole time? Ponder's horticultural knowledge found itself a little exhausted at this point. He tried to remember what he could about his uncle, who'd spent most of his life up a ladder. I, E.R., think camel hair brushes are sometimes involved he began, but Ridcully's expression told him that this wasn't a welcome fact, so he went on, Anyway, sir, ones don't work. And there's another thing, sir. Who smokes the cigarettes? I mean, if the bush just hopes that butts are going to be dropped around the place, who does it think is going to smoke them? What? Ponder sighed. The point about fruit, sir, is that it's a kind of lure. A bird eat the fruit and then, er, drop the seeds somewhere. It's the way the plant spreads its seeds around. But we've only seen birds and a few lizards on this island, so how ah, uh, 
I see what you mean, said R.I.D.C. Oli. You're thinking. What kind of bird stops flying around for a quick smoke? A puffin, said the bursar. Glad to see you're still with us, bursar, said R.I.D.C. Oli, without looking round. Birds don't smoke, sir. You've got to ask yourself what's in it for the bush, you birds don't smoke, sir. You've got to ask yourself what's in it for the bush, you see? If there were people here, well, I suppose you might get a sort of nicotine tree eventually, because they'd smoke the cigarettes I mean, he corrected himself, because he prided himself on his logical thought, these things that look like cigarettes, and stub them out around the place thus spreading the seeds which are in the filter. Some seeds need heat to germinate, sir. But if there aren't any people, the bush doesn't make any sense. We're people, said the dean. And I like a smoke after supper. Everyone knows that. Yes, but with respect, sir, we've only been here a couple of hours and I doubt whether the news has spread all the way to small islands said Ponder patiently, and with, as it turned out, 100% inaccuracy. That's probably not long enough for one to evolve. Are you telling me, said R.I.D.C. Oli, like a man with something on his mind, that you think when you eat an apple you're helping it to, he stopped. It was bad enough about the trees. He sniffed. I shall stick to eating fish. At least they make their own arrangements. At a decent distance, I understand. And you know what think about evolution, Mr. Stubbins. If it I happens, and frankly I've always considered it a bit of a fairy story, it has to happen fast. Look at lemmings, for one thing. Lemmings, sir. Right. The little blighters keep charging over cliffs, right? And how many have ever changed into birds on the way down, At, eh? At. Eh? Well, none, of coup there's my point, said R.I.D.C. Oli triumphantly. And it's no good one of them on the way down thinking, hey, maybe I should waggle my claws a bit, is it? No, what it ought to do is decide really positively about growing some real wings. What, in a couple of seconds? while they're plunging towards the rocks. Best time. But lemmings don't just turn into birds, sir. Lucky for them if they could, though, eh. There was a roar, far off in the little jungle. It sounded rather like a foghorn. Are you sure there aren't any dangerous creatures on this island, said the dean. I think I saw some prawns, said the senior wrangler nervously. No, the Arch-Chancellor was right, it's far too small, said Ponder, trying to dismiss the thought of flying lemmings. It couldn't possibly support anything that could hurt us, sir. After all, what would it eat? Now they could all hear something crashing through the trees. Us, said the Dean hesitantly. A creature blundered out onto the sunset sands. It was large and seemed to be mainly head one huge, reptilian head that looked almost as big as the body below it. It walked on two long hind legs. There was a tail, but given the amount of teeth now showing at the other end the wizards weren't inclined to take in too much additional detail. The creature sniffed the air and roared again. Ah, said R.I.D.C. Oli. The solution to the mystery of the disappearing geographer. I suspect. Well done, Senior Wrangler. I think I'll just... The Dean began. Stay still, sir, hissed Ponder. A lot of reptiles can't see you if you don't move. I can assure you, at the speed intent I nothing is going to see me, the monster turned its head this way and that, and began to lumber forward. Can't see things that don't move, said the Arch-Chancellor. You mean we just have to wait for it to walk into a tree? M.R.S. Whitlow's still sitting there, said the senior wrangler. 
she was in fact spreading some runny cheese on a biscuit in a ladle-like fashion. I don't think she's seen it. R.I.D.C. Oli rolled up his sleeve. I think a round of fireballs, gentlemen, he said. Hold on, said Ponder. This may be an endangered species. So is M.R.S. Whitlow. But do we have the right to wipe out what? Absolutely, said R.I.D.C. Oli. If its creator had meant it to survive he would have given it a fireproof skin. That's your evolution for you, Stubbins. But perhaps we ought to study it. The thing was beginning to get up speed now. It was amazing how fast it could move, considering how big it was. E.R., said Ponder nervously. R.I.D.C. only raised his arm. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.